good morning everyone we are going to going to the second phase of sri shankara jayanti celebration 2022 organized by sri shankara jayanti university of sanskrit kadavi a two day national seminar on indian intellectual tradition is been held as part of this distinguished scholars and academicians from various parts of india have participated and presented papers in the scholastic conference it is a great opportunity and exposure of for the students as scholars and others today's session 3 seminars will be chaired by dr t mini director of iqhc and professor of sense sahitya ssus karate we extend our cordial welcome to dr mini on this occasion the resource person of today's session is dr sharda narayan assistant professor department of natya ngr janaki college chennai dr sharda narayan received a firm foundation in sanskrit literature nyaya and vedanta from the late vidwan c ananda acharya academically brilliant right through she received master's degree in physics and sanskrit from bangalore university and later researched vakyabadiya of bhartrhari at jnu new delhi she has taught physics and physics at notre dame academy patna and mount carmel college bangalore for several years and also taught sanskrit at jnu fluent in tamil kannada hindi sanskrit and english she is also very active in sanskrit drama she also has keen interest in the travel and english literature she is most studied to study she is most suited to studying and uh, interpreting sanskrit text and has already published several research papers and valuable books to the script published books are shastra deepika co-authored with uh, maho maho mahobadhyaya r mani dravid shastri geeta govinda of jayadeva with uh, sujata mohan tirum tirumurai with uh, madangi rektamaji teknadal vakipadiya stotra stoda jadi and dravya today she presents her lecture on an interesting topic rasa in indian aesthetics theory and practice on behalf of sri shankaracharya university and its department we extend our warm welcome dr sharda narayan to sri shankaracharya institution 2020 I welcome Dr. K. R. Ambika, Professor and HOD of Sanskrit Sahitya, SSU Scarity, who will be expressing the vote of thanks. Along with, we welcome the eminent scholars participating in the program, faculty members of various departments, such as scholars, students, and others. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning everybody. Today we are at the second day of the national seminar on Indian intellectual tradition as a part of Shankara Jayanti celebrations phase 2. Today we have an esteemed guest. Her specialty is that she has mastered in physical sciences, then she has studied Sanskrit, then dance and she is working on a an arena of such subjects and an expert in all these subjects I expect. we are waiting for her talk i do, i have no, nothing more to say now after her presentation i will con, uh, coordinate some ideas she had presented now straight away i welcome her to deliver the talk i 
Thank you very much for the most kind. Yes, the first time. Uh, most uh, uh, kind and warm welcome. It's a great privilege for me to be here. And I really thank the organizers for inviting me. I uh, cannot agree with Madam that I am an expert, but I will be happy to share whatever I have learned uh, in, my, in the course of my discussions with the dance uh, department in my college. Vagartha Viva Sampratta Vagartha Pratipatta Jagata Pitaram Vande Parvati Parameshwara Shri Guru Bhyona Maha Sarve Krishna Maha Is it clear? The, the light? Is it okay? Is it visible? So uh, I see I, it's, it's wonderful that uh, we are undergoing a huge revival in the classical studies and the arts in our country at the present time. And it's a great uh, joy to be a part of that, uh, I would say, for the teachers and students. The Rasa theory is a, a fundamental part of the aesthetic uh, tradition of India. So that is the focus of my uh, talk today. Uh, though I would not like to repeat the lesson, you all know the Rasa theory, and I am told we have a very good Natya department here, and the Sanskrit department, of course. So I wouldn't like to repeat what is Rasa and the Rasa theory, but I try like to share some ideas on what it has meant to us and how it has moved uh, through the ages in our tradition. Uh, here is my scheme of presentation for today. We know that the Rasa discussion in the Nati Shastra is the earliest discussion that we have in uh, probably in the world. And even the Nati Shastra date is not clear and considering it refers to a lot of other earlier texts, we know that uh, the, the concept of Rasa is very ancient and it really forms the foundation for the uh, general theory of aesthetics, how we understand art appreciation uh, itself. So we quickly go over that, how that has uh, evolved uh, uh, in the tradition. So the first uh, two units, I will try to go very quickly so that we have a little more time for the other units. There's Rasa in Nati Shastra, there is Rasa in Kavya, then there is Bhakti Rasa, and then uh, uh, art, that is the general theory of art, how the Rasa theory lends itself to a uh, fairly general theory of uh, all kinds of art uh, appreciation. And then there is Bhakti Rasa, which came up later in uh, the course of uh, tradition. And then I would like to, uh, I hope I will have enough time to discuss some of the issues that I find problematic in the modern way uh, that some books uh, present these concepts or interpret these concepts. We know that uh, the Rasa Sutra is in the sixth chapter. It's a very simple uh, description of uh, what happens, how rasa is created. It, it is very, it, it is very striking in its simplicity, but it has lent itself to very, very advanced, complicated, and rigorous discussion in shastra through the ages. Uh, we know the uh, eight uh, rasas, uh, the nine rasas, with their uh, thai bhavas, and the rasa sutra that says vibhava anubhava vyabhichari samyoga. Uh, I think you all know uh, how this works, so I, I don't have to explain that. But uh, just a little bit on what Vibhava is and what uh, Anubhava, etc. Vibhava is the cause or the stimulant. Um, I often uh, relate uh, drama because in a dance department, uh, we have to firstly uh, remind ourselves that Nati Shastra is in the context of theatre, drama in full, not just a dance performance. As we understand dance performance in uh, Bharatanatyam or Mohini, uh, uh, Odyssey or Mohiniyatam today. So given that, we have to understand a full presentation of a story and uh, how it's depicted. It must have a plot, it must have a hero, it must have problems in the plot and then achieve success. So every scene, everything that the choreographer or the director and or the dramatist, uh, everything that they think of should lead to the Rasa experience. So Rasa in one level, when we look at the uh, list of uh, Rasas that we have, they are the moods that have to be created on the stage. 
how do how is a mood created? There are eight kinds of nine kinds of moods, uh, eight uh, are vibrant in drama, and uh, Shantarasa is uh, we, we know that we know the difference. It's eight plus one, all nine are not on equal footing. But the, when you see a movie, or when you go to a performance and the curtain goes up and there is an empty stage, the audience is full of anticipation, but they don't have any particular idea in their mind. Depending on what vibhavas come for, we know which way the mood goes, which way our emotions are excited. So that is the meaning of vibhava. The anubhava are the reactions. Whatever this is the human, whatever is the cause, then the anubhavas follow that and the gadhichari bhavas use this and altogether they create a situation, a mood, where which the audience savors, relishes. That is aswadhyat one. That is what he says. Uh, why do we call them uh, rasa? Uh, bhava iti tasma. Uh, kim bhava, bhavanti iti bhavaha, kim bha, bhava yanti iti bhavaha. Uchyate, vaganda sato opetan, kadyarthan, bhava yanti iti uh, bhavaha. So we know that. Then again, it is uh, uh, the rasa sutra again. Now, what I want to mention here is we understand the rasa sutra, that the samyoga also indicates the samakalginatva. There is a big discussion as to what does the Samyoga mean. Because in the Nati Shastra itself, not just in Abhinava Gupta, Bharata himself gives the analogy of a Panaka where uh, there is uh, lemon and gourd and elaichi and all the spices, and a new flavor is created. So the new flavor is not the flavor of any of the ingredients. So when they are all together, something new is synthesized. That is the Nishpati that he speaks about. Here, I want to point out uh, in the long discussion in Abhinava Bharati that comes after the Rasa Sutra, uh, Abhinava Gupta discusses how, in, from the Shastra point of view, how can we understand this Rasa being formed? I was very happy to note that there are many Nyaya students here, so very serious uh, philosophy students here. So you will understand when I say that in Shastra, in all the Shastras we find, that there is always a very vigorous analysis and a discussion before the validity of anything can be accepted. If somebody puts forth a theory or says such and such uh, entity is there, then it is rigorously analyzed through all the pramanas. How do we know it is there? How do we cognize anything? So the pramana has to be established. Prama karanam pramana. It has to be analyzed and then we can establish that through this pramana uh, we are able to cognize uh, this entity. So a similar, an application of this kind of a Shastri analysis is used here because we have to validate that there is something called Rasa and how is it free. So that is how the, the, the masters that Abhinava Gupta refers to, they use these things to find out what is Nishpati then. The first theory, as you know, it, it, it is well known that I will cut it short. But uh, to quickly go over the arguments, uh, Sri uh, uh, Bhatta Lolata is the first uh, uh, scholar that Abhinava uh, mentions. He explains the Rasa Sutra by the Utpatti Vada. He says the Rasa nish Nishpatti means that Rasa is created anew. An Utpatti or a creation is a new entity. It is created from the causes. There is a Kanya Karana Bhava. And these are the ingredients or these are the kar Karanas that create this Karya, which is Rasa. So that is his explanation. Where are the uh, Vibhavas and Anubhavas uh, there? They are in the Nata. They are on the stage in the actor. Vibhavas by definition, Vibhava, Anubhava, Vyavichari Bhava. They are part of the performing group. They are the, uh, it has to be on the stage. So uh, Abhinava points out two uh, major problems in the Uppati theory, where he says that if there is Karya Karana Bhava and something is created, then it has to be in the same place as where the karana, ka, karanas are. You cannot have uh, the Vibhava Anubhava on the stage and the Rasa experience of the audience. So it has to be in the Nata. So uh, Bhatta Lolata is able to speak of Rasa experience in the Nata only. There is another problem with the Karya Karana Bhava relation, just, just as from clay we create a Dhata or something. After the causes uh, cease to exist or if the causes are not there, the karya is still there. But in this case, it is not possible. So, it, 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 nothing changes. I mean, it, these discussions don't change a performance or the fact that audience enjoys the performance. We are trying to analyze and understand and logically validate this whole thing. So, the, uh, uh, the 
Utpati Vada says inadequate. Then he mentions uh, Sri Shampuka's uh, view where he says it is anumiti because anumiti is a very valid uh, pramana. It is uh, probably the most complicated pramana. It can be used in a very wide uh, situation. So he says it is anumiti because the nata is uh, anukarana. He is uh, enacting. He is uh, you know copying or uh, his angika, uh, all the uh, uh, abhinayas are closely following the hero. In that, uh, very often Abhinava Gupta refers to the Ramayana and tells us that uh, Ramayana and the Ramayana was very popular those days uh, in all parts of the country, or, or in many, most places, as it is even today. There's a Ramayana tradition. So he seems to refer to that. And he says that uh, uh, because of the similarity of the movements, we are able to infer that this is how Rama was, this is how Rama and Sita were. Whatever story you take up, from what the actors are doing, we are inferring what was the original uh, event, and that is how we understand. So that is uh, Sri, uh, Sri Shampuka's theory. Now here the objection is, nobody has seen the original. Nobody, uh, the, the actor has not seen uh, the original drama. The audience has not seen the original drama. So how can you tie up anonymity here? It is, it is not logically tenable. So this theory is also inadequate. Then Bhattanayaka says there is a Bhukti, bhukti Vada. He says uh, Rasa is not created afresh, Rasa is not inferred, but it is felt, it is experienced, it is enjoyed and it is something that they are enjoying. Now Abhinava Gupta only modifies uh, uh, Bhattanayaka's, uh, he refines it further, he takes it more to a mental level or a spiritual level and he explains more clearly how the Sai Bhava which is in everybody, in this case, the Sai Bhava is relevant in the Prekshapa, in the spectator, not in the Nata. He goes further to say that uh, uh, there is, uh, you know, what, what he means is Natya Shastra is very clear that in Natya, the Sai Bhava or the emotions of the uh, actor are not relevant. It doesn't forbid them from enjoying the role or feeling the Rasa, but if they are not relevant, so well, uh, this, the, the actor's skill and training in conveying what he conveys is far more important than what he feels inside. I often tell uh, my uh, class that uh, the good uh, film actors, they may have suffered a tragedy in their personal life the previous day, but they may come and, uh, because uh, the shooting is important and it's been arranged, they will come and present a very happy, uh, genuinely good uh, performance. So it, it is a skill, it is the ability of that vocation, of that art. Uh, Bharata is very clear that the feelings of the Nata are uh, of uh, no consequence here. Um, this is another point I wanted to make. So then, uh, uh, th this is an important point stage, logically, where the rasa experience moves from the actor to the spectator. We must note that in the uh, arguments that Abhinava Gupta presents. So Abhinava Gupta takes this, he was a Shaivite uh, philosopher and uh, he was also a Tantra scholar and Kashmir uh, Shaivism was his subject. Uh, I don't know how much of that he directly puts in here. He was a great master who uh, gave the commentary for the Nadi Shastra. But it is a fact that he goes to the uh, Pratyabhidya kind of a concept uh, where the, the rasa is already there, but it is a recognition or a manifestation of that. So the abhidhyakti, that the fact that in that situation, while performing a while watching a performance, you see, even remembering that you enjoyed a performance very well, you liked it, that day you saw this, you are telling you are telling a friend of yours that it was such a wonderful performance. Even all that does not become rasa experience. Rasa experience is only at that moment that we are part of the uh, audience watching the performance. In fact, even any number of rehearsals will not be the same because we help the students rehearse so many times, but ultimately when we are sitting in the uh, dark uh, auditorium and the proper lights and the costume, that is the actual outcome. That is when we actually feel what the performance is like. So Abhinav Gupta has taken this to uh, a spiritual level. You know the alaukika aspect. Uh, for one thing, the allowed, it is allowed because it doesn't conform to the pramanas that we deal with in Nyaya uh, and Tarka uh, logically. It is not rational, it, is, it does not follow the norms of the real world in which we live. So that is the first point for Alokita. The second point is that it doesn't follow the profit and gain or the personal, uh, what the person, personal uh, identity or uh, their relations with time and space. If they, in, in Rasa experience, they are removed from our real time and real space and they are absorbed in the uh, 
performance, the story of the performance. The third point he makes, I mean, uh, I split it into three. The other point he makes is that there is a very high spiritual experience, which he has equated to Brahmananda Sahodana. So we know this, even in modern terminology, we talk of relaxation, de-stress and all these issues. Uh, it, it, it goes very similar to uh, the kind of uh, mental state that Abhinav Gupta has uh, uh, described. He also says that when we, when we know that uh, in a drama, as Bharata says, certain rasas help build up another, whereas certain rasas uh, dis destroy, they weaken the building up of the main rasa. So we can accept that there are smaller rasas or moods, so there will be many moods in a performance. There should be, even if it's a tragedy, there may be some comic relief, there may be some love scenes. So there would be a combination, so to give uh, relief and give variety. Variety is highly prized. So rasa, rasa corresponds to moods and rasa, the maharasa he talks of, uh, corresponds to the ultimate feeling of bliss uh, when the uh, spectator feels at the uh, climax of uh, the uh, end result of a good performance. So uh, that is uh, what I have about uh, the Nati Shastra. We just look at Abhinava Bharati here. I have uh, such a vibhavadi baladiti bhavaha vaktavyaha. Tatra na agnyata lauki kasya adi chitta vritte he na agnyata lauki ka ratya adi chitta vritte he kaver natasya va tat vishaya vishishta vibhava dhyaharanam shakyamiti sthai naha upishtaha. So he says that uh, the sthais are mentioned because unless a person knows in real life what that emotion is, you cannot depict or relate to it in art also. So the sthai bhavas are the real emotions. When they are uh, evoked due to art, then they are rasa. Tasmat hetu bhir vibhavakyaihi kaviyaihi cha anubhavatmabihi sahachari rupais cha vyavichari vidi prayatnarjita taya kritri mairabhi tatha anabhi manya manay anuptatru sattvena linga balataha pratiya manaha sthai bhavo mukhya ramadhi gata sthai anukarana rupaha. I don't know if it is clear, uh, otherwise, Anukarana Rupatva Devacha Namantarena Vyapadishto Nasaha Vibhavahi Kavya Balanu Sandheyaha Anubhavaha Shikshataha Vyavicharinaha Kritrima Janita Anubhavarjana Bala I am reading this text because it will be relevant in my last section when we are looking at some of the modern interpretations. So then I would like to connect it to see if uh, there is room for those kind of uh, uh, doubts and interpretations or not. This uh, is very simple here. Uh, the, when it comes to bhava, uh, the Nati Shastra says, he says, is, uh, what are bhavas? He says, Uchyate, Vaganga, Sattva, Petan, Kavyarthan, Bhava, Yandhiti, Bhava, Iti. Atta Vibhava, Iti, Kasmat, Uchyate. Vibhavo, Vijnanartaha, Vibhavaha, Karanam, Nitam, Yetu, Iti, Padhyayaha. Vibhavyante anena vaganga sattva dinaya ityato vibhavaha. Yata vibhavitam vijnatam ityartantaram. So he says it pervades. What do we mean by that? Just as we say that it just per pervades that whole scene. There was a mood of uh, uh, gloom pervading the scene. We use these kind of sentences in uh, English while writing a story or describing. So they are referring to that. Atta anubhava iti kasmat uchyate. Anyway, he says, Tatra vibhava anubhava loka prasiddha. You see, modern uh, people point out that uh, Bharata has not uh, defined the sthai bhavas and they point out that Bharata has not uh, defined or uh, explained the vibhava and anubhava. But he clearly says that these are to be selected according to the story, according to the situation. And he says, loka prasiddha. So when he has not defined, it means that there is full freedom to uh, take it the way they want. Now we come to a different aspect. Uh, by the time we, uh, we come to the uh, 12th century or so, there is a distinct shift. What we see in Natya texts, there is a shift from Natya, from as a whole drama, to dance, dance pradhana. The Nitta Ratnavali and the Sangeeta Ratnakara don't speak much about drama. They speak a lot about dance. So we understand that uh, Rupakas had uh, given way to Uparupakas. Maybe drama was still there in vernaculars and folk styles, but when we look at the Sanskrit stream and the uh, Shastra for the Margi dance, we find this shift. 
And uh, the Sahitya Ratnakara, this, uh, these shlokas put uh, the essence of the entire discussion on uh, uh, Rasa in the Nati Shastra very succinctly. Uh, maybe I will save time in not reading that. Uh, next we come to Rasa in uh, Kavya. Even before the time of Abhinava Gupta, the concept of Rasa had been applied or extended or uh, explained in the context of literature alone. Literature was earlier understood as something heard. Uh, modern writers say literature read and then they look at the printed uh, verses and uh, even more uh, commonly uh, modern uh, scholars and uh, western ideologists look at uh, poetry in their translation. So for them it is more of the meaning that uh, they are looking at. They are not fully uh, tuned to the actual structure of the poetry or how it sounds. Uh, most poetry was heard either in Parayanams or Harikathas or with instrumental uh, accompaniment also. It was not Rekshya, it was not seen, but it was heard. So the, the audible aspects of poetry is actually very important. Uh, so they say uh, that is one thing. But when it comes to, comes to Rasa, it's a mood that it evokes. Of course the music and the percussion, the drums, those help. Because if it's suspense, then the percussion is there. If it's Arbuta or fear, then it's more striking. If somebody is saying something very serious or profound, then you have the drums uh, aiding that. So definitely uh, instrumental accompaniment helps in the conveying of the mood and the rasa, even in literature. We do have uh, the Dhanya Loka, of course, is the uh, landmark uh, text that applies this. Again, I have a long quotation. I don't know if there will be time. I am ever he Mahakavya Mukhyo Vyaparo, Yad Rasadhi Neva, Mukhyataya, Kavyarthi Krutya, Tad Vyakti Anuguna Kvena, Shtanam, Arthanam, Cha, Uva Nibandhanam. So there he says uh, in, uh, in literature what happens is the person is able to imagine all the aspects of Vibhava, Anubhava, etc. They are not visible before his eyes. But by the power of uh, the narrative, we are able to uh, conceptualize the whole situation and the mood comes through. So this is what they explain. And Abhinava Gupta also uh, writes, uh, he says, Tadrupa rasa charvanayatu prabhande. Uh, I will not read it, I will quickly summarize. Uh, he says, in the same discussion after the Rasa Sutra, he says that in a composition of any length, in a prabhanda, then the vibhavas, anubhavas, all these can be mentioned. But in a muktaka, in a single verse, like you have Subhashitas or you have a shayari in a modern uh, literature, the two lines or the four lines, as the case may be, that itself will somehow tell you what is the situation, in what context, what kind of a person is saying that. It becomes implicit in these things. Of course, one should be able to understand the full import of that uh, verse, that couplet. So in Muktaka, he says that the listener supplies all this with his own imagination. And he goes further to say, it's just, uh, uh, Even if there is a limited explanation of Vibhavas and others, Parisputa eva sakshatkara kalpaha kavyartaha spurati. They, they are able to envisage the entire literature and the uh, meaning, the kavyartha spurati. It, it shines for them. Ata eva tesham kavyam eva priti yutpati krit anapekshita nadyamati. So for such people with very sensitive uh, feelings and uh, keen imagination, you don't even need nadya. Literature alone can give them that full sense. Tesham avitu nadyam. So it's like the moon beams uh, just glistening. But those who are unable to have that sensitivity, uh, uh, for those who are unable to uh, feel the beauty of that kavya on their own, the natya helps. The music, the vadya, the singing, the actions, uh, the lights, all these things, Add to them, they are able to envisage better and merge with the uh, uh, performance. So Abhinava has uh, said this uh, to compare, uh, to sort of give the connection between how we uh, experience rasa in uh, Kavya and in uh, Natya. Natya is the starting point. If we take a quick look at some of the landmark uh, 
definitions of uh, kavya, uh, we, we see a slight shift. I mean, I'm not saying that there, it's a deliberate shift, or, uh, but we can see that the earlier definitions look at the body of literature. They look at the structure and the uh, language itself. Whereas the later ones look at it a little more from the emotional response of the rasika. Shabdartau sahitau kavyam is, uh, the shabda is also so important. The sounds of uh, what words are chosen to make that poetry. Vamana, Bamaha, Vamana, very early. Kavyam, Grahyam, Alankara. And Alankara does not mean an external ornament that uh, we wear. Of course, I know that in later literature they are likened to the earrings or the jewelry that a lady may wear. But in early literature, Alankara does not only mean what is external. Because he says, Saundaryam Alankara. It is in intrinsic and it is a part of the uh, structure itself. Uh, in Tirumurai, in one of the Tirunavkarasa's uh, songs, he talks, he talks of Poovinik Karangalam Pungu Tamarai, Poovinik Karangalam Kota Milladu. So the ornament of flowers is lotus. The ornament of a king is impartiality. So these things and, and the, the ornament of the Avinik Karangalam. So the, it, the Anandalam actually more, it, it translates as a crowning glory rather than an external ornament. So, uh, probably the earlier writers were uh, referring to that aspect, not just the figures of speech, as Alankara Shastra, as Alankara are later classified as figures of speech. But in the earlier uh, texts, I think it, some, it refers to something more uh, intrinsic and implicit in the uh, structure. Of course, Ananda Vardhana Kavya Atma Dhvaniti and then Vakyam Rasatmakam Kavya. So we, have, we see how the dhvani and the rasa theory became more important in later uh, poetics. Now, why I am uh, bringing this is to show the connect between the rasa theory with our general uh, theory of aesthetics that we have. Uh, because I, I don't know if some writers are uh, being defensive to uh, allegations by some Western scholars that India did not have an aesthetic theory. And there are allegations that uh, it was Abhinav Gupta who spoke of the Rasa experience in The Spectator. So till, uh, until Abhinav Gupta said this, we never had an aesthetic theory. Because Bharata talks of uh, Rasa in the uh, stage, on the stage in the actors. But uh, Bharata has said Preksha Kaidi, so I don't think that allegation is really tenable. But what I want to point out here uh, is uh, one thing, Mamata's uh, Mangala Shloka, he says, Kladaika Mahi. When he talks of Kavya, what is the difference between poetic language and ordinary language? Poetic language, reality is a mixture of good and bad, ugly, beautiful, everything, temporary, permanent, everything. But in art, one selects what one wants. So this uh, verse which he praises uh, poetic language, in fact, uh, I think uh, represents the attitude of what we think of art in general. So I wanted to mention that, and I see that whenever we criticize the Rasa theory as uh, 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 an aesthetic theory that is uh, speaking only of the Rasika or always involved as a mental uh, process, and then the question whether art, an art object, or art is subjective or objective, these kind of questions come up. Uh, Sometimes uh, critics make it look like uh, the Indian uh, poetics uh, shastra were inadequate or they did not cover all aspects or they were not aware of certain aspects. I feel there is not much room for that because we need to differentiate between technique of a style or an art and a concept of art. If you look at the concept of art, which is a pure aesthetic theory in that sense, if you look at uh, uh, you know, what is aesthetic experience, what is art appreciation, those questions have very clearly been answered. Probably it started in the context of uh, Natya, and then many writers have extended to art experience in general. Now, if you say a painting, how do we appreciate a painting? Is there a text that tells, explains why a painting is beautiful and how we appreciate it? I don't know, maybe we have to look, maybe we have not looked enough into texts that deal with the, those particular uh, crafts and the, the techniques of those arts, sculpture. Agama Shastras, of course, they tell, uh, say a lot about uh, uh, temple architecture and uh, about painting, it's a practical thing. The techniques were well understood 
even when we talk of uh, rasa in literature or rasa in natya again we are talking about the technique where is the rasa in an objective sense where is the rasa in natya it is in the vibhava and bhava we are talking about so those are very clearly understood well defined the so much of training in the karanas and the hastas and the charis and then there are so many hints as to which is suitable for what mood etc so i think we need to appreciate that uh, many of our texts are in the context of a giving practical value and to understand that it's not an armchair kind of a commentary on that part so if we accept that and then look for these ideas i'm sure uh, we'll be able to bring uh, out a lot more uh, statements on pure art appreciation for example in western literature and modern uh, literature we often find the uh, pure art in fact i think uh, it was uh, max muller or somebody who said india did not have a pure aesthetic theory or something i think a lot of writers are uh, uh, responding to this and being defensive and saying no no we had this i feel we had it there's no doubt about that we just go ahead and separate technique and concept and uh, look at it that way i don't think there was anything like it what is pure art if you say pure art then would you want to know what kind of art what is the medium the, the, who is a pure artist either the one is a painter or a sculptor or a poet or a dramatist or a today we have on stage we have a lights expert you have decoration expert i mean everything is an art so then you have people who specialize then it goes down to technique but what is the overall um, comprehensive uh, concept that unites all these nahi rasat rate kashchad artak avartate nobody does anything except for enjoyment the outcome should be enjoyed So I think all the basic theories are there. It's a question of how we uh, look at it. Uh, temple uh, art and uh, sculpture was also highly symbolic in India. It is not just uh, a, a decision on what is aesthetically pleasing or uh, what is beautiful, but it carried a lot of symbolism in it. Like the Nataraja icon is uh, considered one of the most artistic compositions in the whole world, but it has this very um, uh, uh, it is replete with so much of symbolism we have the panchabhutas and the panchakriyas and then that uh, dwarf uh, that uh, he is uh, standing upon there is so much of profound symbolism also that has been absorbed into the artistic representation in fact many of the arts uh, in, in, in such examples temple sculpture and frescoes uh, and art uh, it was a way of uh, uh, transmitting philosophical ideas or concepts into a visual uh, Way that the people could easily understand. I wanted to mention this. These are much later. These are in the Middle Ages in the recent uh, centuries, uh, where the Ashtan Ayikas of the Nadi Shastra have inspired so much of Rajasthani painting, Mughal painting. If you look carefully, you will find all the motifs. The first one is uh, Kalahantarika, where the Sakhi is trying to uh, mediate and make peace. and uh, radha and krishna became motifs of romantic literature and the uh, sadara rasa they are not uh, necessarily very uh, devotional or religious uh, uh, paintings but they became very popular because of uh, so many songs and hindustani music also you have so many situations of krishna teasing the gopis or radha and krishna or any gopis with krishna so it was a very popular uh, motif in music and uh, poetry and we find in painting also that is uh, khandika Uh, vasaka sarja and uh, abhisarika the vasaka sarja has the uh, typical motif of the bed of leaves that she has covered ca- collected in the forest and so that she is able to sit uh, comfortably on a soft bed of soft fresh leaves etc the abhisarika this painting has something interesting uh, this is from anand kumar swami's book on the ashtanaikas where it is based on a hindi text on ashtanaikas not a sanskrit text because in north india these concepts were very popular and they were very much uh, valued in the performing arts and the fine arts but they moved into hindi texts and local language texts there uh, in uh, novel have i seen uh, in uh, sanskrit texts uh, as part of abhisarika uh, but in the hindi book it says that she was so eager to meet her beloved that the lightning and thunder didn't stop her and the snakes and scorpions didn't stop her. so those things are added here and i would like to mention that it is not part of sanskrit drama anyway we come to a slightly different uh, topic now because we are dealing with rasa 
uh, we know we have uh, 8 plus 1 mild rasas and then we have bhakti rasa also. With the advent of the bhakti movement all over the country, people were uh, reveling and enjoying satsangs and bhajan sessions, where it is not like watching a performance on a stage. In a satsang, every person is a part of the activity. They are merged in the activity and the feelings are much stronger and they lie up, they, they are merged in that. So over the centuries, this has also been uh, studied and uh, explained. Uh, the uh, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu of uh, Rupa Goswami is a relatively later text. It's about 1558, the uh, date given, middle of the 16th century. By that time, probably the uh, devotional uh, depiction of uh, uh, Puranic stories uh, had reduced in India. Maybe it had become part of folk theatre. But in cities and in more sophisticated uh, performing arts, that had probably gone out of vogue because of uh, political reasons, socio-political reasons, economic reasons. Of course, it is there in folk theatre, but uh, I think that we have... Okay, now that's comfortable. Yes, I have the last two weeks, I think it should be fine. Oh, I have all those discussions. So, anyway, so that, that is Bhakti Rasa. Bhakti Rasa, when we analyze, he very beautifully points out what are the vibhavas, what are the anubhavas, etc. It is similar to literature, but it's a much deeper involvement. I think I should be quick about this. Uh, the normal bhakti is uh, explained as samanya kaha, that is in general, bhakti is explained as sadhana bhakti, bhava bhakti, and uh, uh, prema bhakti. The sadhana bhakti is a lifestyle, a di discipline to uh, purify the mind and make it calm and to be receptive to higher devotion. When that enters the mind, it's called bhava bhakti. And when the bhava, with the bhava bhakti, when the love for the divine becomes very intense in the person, they call it uh, prema bhakti. I think I won't go into details. Uh, it is available uh, in these uh, texts. Very, very uh, succinct and very comprehensive uh, uh, definition of what is bhakti, etc. That is, uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was a great uh, uh, proponent of this form of it actually offers an al bhakti marga, an alternate form of reaching the uh, divine. Now, some problems in uh, modern uh, interpretation. I think with one or two examples, you may understand uh, what is my uh, what is the point I'm trying to make. Uh, what is pure art? So, the question that India didn't have pure art, uh, but uh, did, was there any art abroad that we didn't have? Then, you know, people who ask these questions should be able to answer some of those uh, things. It's not enough to uh, form a lot of questions and questions, but do those questions really have any answers? I'd like to read this. It's a little tedious, but I really must because you get an idea of what this is like. This is from Sheldon Pollard's uh, Rasa Reader. He says in the introduction, this is the introductory part of his uh, book, which is supposed to be a com comprehensive account of Indian aesthetics. He says, for one thing, there was no unified sphere with a particular designation we could translate by the English term art. There were separate cultural domains of poetry, kavya, drama, natya, music, sangeeta, consisting of vocal and instrumental music and dance, and less carefully thematized practices with terminology also less settled, including painting, chitra, sculpture, often pusta, architecture, for which there was no common term at all, and the crafts, kala, which could include many of the preceding, when that was deemed necessary. In these disparate domains, there was never any dispute, at least overtly, about what was and what was not to be included, though sometimes works passed into and out of a given category according to historically changing reading or viewing practices. Furthermore, if almost everything outside the literary realm, let alone the cultural realm, remained outside classical Indian aesthetic analysis, including nature, Though Shiva was a dancer, God in India was generally not an artist. Now, I'm not sure what kind of an outlook uh, this uh, portrays in an introduction to uh, uh, aesthetics. And uh, besides, there are several errors in this uh, account. He has very cleverly included the uh, Kala as crafts. What about Michelangelo? Did he one day suddenly pick up a brush and start painting something? Didn't he undergo decades of apprenticeship under a master? where they learnt the materials, they learnt what is a wet wall, what is a stone. And, and during, incidentally, during Michelangelo's time, there was a great fascination with the uh, uh, anatomy. 
they were dissecting the dissections and they were understanding a lot more about digestion, metabolism, muscles, all that. So that reflects in this culture because he tried to portray how the muscles would be if they turned this way or that way. So there was a, I mean, it corresponds with uh, Da Vinci and all those uh, uh, intellectuals who were very fascinated with the perfection of the beauty of the body. So this reflects in his art. And, uh, but uh, there are so many painters, nobody uh, became a, you know, a genius uh, out of the blue like that. So I don't think that kind of a concept is quite fair. And uh, Pusta is wrongly translated as uh, sculpture. Pusta is used in Aharya Bhinaya, we call glue and paper and uh, cloth and paint and you know, the, those kind of lightweight uh, props that we make. That's why I think Pustaka is because it's uh, put together with glue that we have the word Pustaka is. So that is a wrong uh, 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 translation there. And even the Upanishads uh, speak of uh, Kavi, uh, the Supreme being Kavi as the original creator. So I don't know what uh, this uh, really leads to. Uh, David Frawley writes that most Westerners do not go beyond the surface in what they see of Indian culture. He says the Western mind tends to reduce Shiva to iconographic and anthropomorphic appearances, which derive from a very different cultural milieu of ancient India. That is uh, David Frawley's. Uh, uh. So it's not as if the Western world would have a, a pure artist. If you say artist, immediately you say, oh, what does he do? So, unless there is a medium which will dictate the whole form of that art, uh, how can you speak of a pure theory of art? So, then the question whether the art is in the object or is in the mind of the Rasika. We have many quotations that uh, say it is objective and then it says uh, it is uh, subjective also. Uh, there is a book by William Kulkarni on Abhinava Gupta's aesthetics. He has collected a lot of uh, sayings uh, on both sides. One of them, he says, uh, Abhinava Gupta says in Lochana, he says, Nahi Vita Rago Viparya Stan Bhavan Pashyati. Nahi Asya Veena Kvanitam Kaka Radhika Kalpam Pratipati. A Vita Raga is supposed to be beyond uh, the influence of Shrigara, Rasa, or any uh, poetry or drama that you can uh, move his feelings. But even he will know, he will not think a Veena playing is a crow uh, coin. They will not be moved by that, but they will know, know what it is. So that points to the um, Objective part. Uh, then uh, Pollock translates Vidhava as a factor, but doesn't explain what it is at all. He's not able to uh, really uh, put together what the relation, what their functions are in the Rasa Sutra. Anything that has a bearing on an equation is a factor, but unless you explain how it works, uh, there is no point. Uh, S.S. Barlinge is another uh, writer. He also says that. Uh, uh, I have a quotation, but maybe we have to skip that. Uh, he also says that uh, Bharata meant Vasa in the stage and uh, Abhinava Gupta has taken it to a spiritual experience. And all writers are following that and we have forgotten what Bharata intended. But uh, again, what Bharata intended is in the technical aspect, which nobody has really forgotten. In any, uh, any area that we apply this theory, we have to make a difference between the practical applications and the overall theory. So just because, and, and how much can you discuss a technique that is there in the living tradition in the way the arts are propagated. Uh, so the, the uh, abstract theory has uh, continued. Now Pollock writes, from such an analytical perspective, the play looks like a jumble of disconnected components. They are ultimately combined into a whole where each component is at once preserved and subsumed. So to talk about it as a jumble is, then this Bhakti Rasa I explained, uh, to point out that in the Rasa Vida, which is funded by Columbia University, which is supposed to be a comprehensive uh, encyclopedia of uh, Indian uh, aesthetic tradition. When it comes to talking about Bhakti Rasa, the subtitle of that section is No Rules for the Number of Rasas. So why should there be rules? They have explained why we are counting Bhakti as a separate uh, Rasa. And then uh, another major problem, which I don't know if I'll be able to discuss, is the concepts of samskara and then auchitya, propriety and morality are all mixed up in modern studies. They allege that uh, we are so fascinated with dharma and morality and uh, what is uh, correct that uh, our aesthetic theory is closely connected with what is uh, morally right. That's not true. We have quotations that say that literature should only delight, it should not teach. But in case it teaches, then the value of that entertainment becomes higher. 
I don't think there is a single Hollywood movie or, or a successful Hollywood movie in which the hero does not win. Why don't we have a movie where uh, the hero does not win? So there are certain principles in art and performing art. I won't go into the consequences of the why it is that I'm sure you all know that it should inspire society. Society should get some inspiration, some enjoyment and some learning. It is not as if vulgar arts are not there for the entertainment of the moment, but they are not discussed enough in our texts. It doesn't mean that in the world we don't have uh, um, art that is simply catering to some uh, class uh, gratification. It must have been there. The other point is this uh, samskara. He says, uh, I have a, a, a quote there, but you may not have time. He says, uh, uh, the entire uh, rasa theory of India is contingent on transmigration. I have the quotation there, but I have uh, uh, sort of uh, condensed it. Because of uh, samskara. So he says, since they believe in transmigration, and there is uh, rebirth, and uh, samskara, and vasana, and all these things, and rasa theory is dependent on that. So rasa theory is not relevant in the modern world. This is this uh, um, observation on this uh, comment on the theory. Now, what do we, uh, where do we find the samskara relevant in uh, our aesthetic theory? We say that the more samskara a person has, the more he understands that crowd. If a foreigner visits India the first time and watches a Bharatanatyam performance or any classical Indian art form for the first time, there is only a small percentage of it that they will absorb. They will notice the costume, they will, they will have a few observations. But if they don't know the uh, Nakitani, the mudras, say, or the motives, or they don't know the Puranic story, or they don't know the Ragas, they are not going to become absorbed in the performance. The more a person knows, even to uh, appreciate Carnatic music uh, concerts, uh, people say the more trained the ear, you know, the person, they, they, they enjoy it better. So the samskara only refers to that. It refers to, again, the emotional baggage that a person may have. We cannot deny that a mother may relate to a Yashoda Krishna episode strongly. A person in love may enjoy a Shankara episode much uh, deeper. We, we cannot deny that different people have different priorities or different uh, uh, sensibilities and sensitivities and they will, will respond accordingly to the drama. If two people like uh, a movie equally deeply, they may like different scenes for their own personal uh, reasons. So samskara is a fact, it is uh, uh, part of the person's uh, emotional and the samskara as you know in uh, Shastra is defined as the impression of a previous experience. This is enough for rasa experience. We don't have to go to the previous birth. This birth itself, there are so many things that help us. If you, when we drive home from college or work, we take left turn, right turn, we go to a shop to do the shopping, we are using so much of samskara. We know the way, we know where to go, we know what the traffic is. There are so many, we cannot function without using, drawing upon samskara every moment. That's why we go to a new place and we are more wary, we don't know how to do that. So when we talk of samskara, at what point does it go to uh, transmigration or uh, previous birth? Like Vamana talks of uh, Pratibha, when it is inborn. So beyond the point when we cannot explain where it came from, then they have said that some Purva Janva samskara. Because we want to have a logical uh, reason, we want to have a logical, uh, uh, tightly knit uh, concepts in our philosophy. Even in modern uh, parlance, we say inborn traits and acquired traits. So we cannot do away with some of these things. And perhaps the inborn traits, they have used those words as Purva Janma Samskara. But it has no uh, relevance if you are talking about one performance or an artistic appreciation. Ultimately, if you say why some people like the song very much, there is no answer, then you say uh, Abhrishta or uh, But to, uh, to state that, uh, this is to understand rasa as a historical form of thought, however, as I try to enable the reader of this reader to do, is to confront the theory clearly contingent on a non-modern worldview and understanding of literary art. Its full, full conceptualization is intimately tied to a number of primary, uncontested and largely non-transferable Indian presuppositions about the threefold psychophysiology of Sankhya, for example, or the storage of memories of past lives or even transmigration. Uh, there are some uh, writings in modern uh, English, uh, modern writings also which uh, create uh, problems in uh, uh, 
explanation or the, uh, the interpretation. I think uh, there are certain Sanskrit non-translatables we have to accept and deal with. I find in uh, recent uh, books, uh, the uh, book in the middle, uh, he translates uh, Sporta as explosion and uh, Chamatkara, something that delights you, but something that charms you and strikes you as very beautiful or very witty, Chamatkara in poetry or drama. He translates it as a miracle. And uh, he, uh, there are, uh, he discusses this question of beauty and concept of beauty and do we have a discussion on what is beauty or what is pure aesthetics. He goes into great length expressing a lot of uh, doubt. Finally, he says, that is the Barlinge book, he says, beauty is not different to the appreciation of beauty. Now, after 300 pages, you come to this statement. Beauty is not different to the appreciation of beauty. So that is what they have said from the beginning and there is nothing one can really do about it. It's not like a modern person can come up with a better theory. The third book is what uh, my colleague and I have written on uh, Gita Bhavantan, the complete translation. Uh, it has a good introduction, but at a basic level, for both the Natya tradition and the Sanitya tradition of our country. So sounds and this my last point. Uh, many writers, Pollock and Barlinge, in fact I have the quotation there, they discount the sound value of the uh, poetry uh, totally. Uh, Barlinge uh, criticizes Natya Shastra for including uh, alphabets and phonetics for under Rajika Because in those days when they are dealing with the subject of language, they start from the basics. They start with the, what the monotics are, what is uh, the Swadhika, because you need it for Vrita, you need it for Chandras. And then if what are Mudu Varnas, what are Karkasha, because in poetry you can have songs with only Mudu Varnas. So he, he starts off with that. Um, he says, for example, in giving the theory about literature, Bharata deals with grammar too. He talks of vowels and consonants and how they are combined into words and sentences. He also talks of nouns and forms they take through cases and also talks of indeclinables, avyaya and the karakas. At some point he also talks of meters, chandas, which in a way are important for the development of poetry. He also gives the definition of meters and enumerates several of them like malini, etc. He lays down that the poetic structure should be composed in such meters. No such discussions have any direct bearing upon literature proper. So after giving an account of what all there is, uh, the modern writer goes a step further in commenting on saying that these discussions have no direct bearing upon literature form. I think Bharata has given them because he understands they are fundamental to the subject of literature. So I think I will stop here uh, because uh, I must keep up the time. Thank you very much for this uh, opportunity. If there are any questions, uh, it mentioned uh, Thank you, Madam, for keeping up with the schedule. Uh, she had presented a well-studied paper on the topic of the RESA and its uh, RESA theory, its practical aspects, okay, the aspect of spectator, etc. There is a 10 minutes time for discussion. Any student or teacher who is interested can ask her questions. Thank you, madam. It was a nice presentation, but I have some doubts. Uh, whether Abhinavagupta accepts the Brahmananda Sahodratva of Resa. I think he does not uh, accept the Brahmananda Sahodratva. And uh, I think there is some correction also. Kutramehi api tatha anabhimanyamanaehi. This sentence is about the uh, Shangugas opinion, not of uh, Abhinavagupta's opinion. No, it doesn't come under Shankar's opinion. It comes after that discussion of the. Okay, opinion. then okay, okay. Yes, fine. Then the question what is Rasa is important? The Rasa Sutra going round about the process of origination. Vibhava, Nubhava, Vijayadi, Samyoga. 
that is only a process of origination of resa but what is resa the definition of resa what is the definition of resa is important i think uh, avinavta has uh, clearly mentioned this uh, yes, uh, but this 10th century is why i was a bit careful is a lot of people criticize that we are reading into bharata what abhinava has said so that is why i wanted to separate them. whatever bharata has said is quite simple and uh, brief yes but it, it, it supports whatever but abhinava gupta has a his view he has a uh, he takes his further into the uh, spiritual aspect uh, and as to what is rasa bharata has made it very clear that it is the enjoyment it is the aswadhya and then it makes it special from a day they derive
can you give an example to? Uh, no, I cannot give an example. I, I don't know. I have not read it fully. Okay. If there is any reference to uh, Athavati in uh, Shastra, I don't know. Oh, okay. Even music, I will mention here because uh, so many students. I am not very well versed in music. I am very basic level. Of course, I enjoy music very much. But I feel that uh, music is another area of research where uh, we need to look at these uh, issues to see uh, how uh, they speak of uh, specific bhavas or uh, specific uh, rasas and things. But why have they said? Is there an aesthetic theory as to why they say? Uh, again, when it comes to the technique, I, we, there is no doubt that we were very advanced in our understanding. Because the ragas are defined and then the samvadi and the vadi is there and the vivadi is also existing. Why aesthetically it does not suit that one? But have they said why? When you say I like this, are we obliged to say why we like it? Or can we say why we like it? That becomes the abstract aesthetic theory in question. Okay. Why we consider mm -hmm. Bhakti Rasa as a separate Bhakti Rasa? Because sometimes we have to accept Bhakti Rasa as a separate one. Because when we study Jivanaka Lady, actually Jivanaka Lady is a Bhavya, Kushagra, uh, in the 94th Shloka, we mentioned Samara Bhavya, Samara Shloka, Kavya Shloka, Rahman. So, it consists of all qualities of a poet. But then we study Jivanaka Lady. Uh, it can be said that uh, I am uh, sorry if I came to as uh, indicating I had a problem with that. I don't have a problem with that. I was quoting in general talk in saying that there is no room for the number of persons. So, what kind of uh, uh, thing is that? When you are trying to convey something about this tradition, you may not agree, you may not uh, really empathize with that. So you, uh, why would anybody have a belief for that situation? Oh, so, the leader, the Western leader who is studying this, uh, what did they say? Oh, there are no rules. It's a kind of very good. But there is a historical development. There is a reason. Uh, the people are enjoying the Sat Sahana and the Sotra and the And the people are entitled to uh, enjoy that. We don't need anybody's solution. And the theme of the movement is a very popular movement all over the world. And uh, this concept has only been explained. It may have taken a few hundred years. Before uh, this, uh, uh, they are analyzed, and he gives the most of the book is full of examples of uh, verses talking about the Raghavan of anywhere, even talking about the Kutri, the Kamsa, all these examples. Then he points out, here is the Baba, here is the Baba, and this is the And that's how he has uh, separated the five types where there is Matsala Rasa and the Pelin, which are the people that is not high. So there are five different types of Bhakti Rasa houses that they explain with the examples of which song, which bhajan. So what is our feeling when we are looking for that? So, my man, I fully really accept that Bhakti Rasa is a very strong feeling with a large number of people. I think no one has any other questions. Now, I think we can conclude this session. I invite Dr. K. R. Ambika from the Department of Sanskrit to deliver the formal vote formal of science. Sarveshram Namaskar. On behalf of the Shankara Chayanti second phase of this year, we thankful to you for our fruitful your, your fruitful words. Uh, in this occasion, uh, I extend my sincere gratitude to uh, Dr. Swathanarayanan. Then I convey my regards to Dr. Timini, chair of the session, and thanks to uh, Dr. Satyan uh, giving the welcome speech. 
I extend our sincere thanks to our beloved students, teachers, and other uh, scholars and well, well wishers to attend this function and participate press, uh, at, uh, press, uh, at, participate in this um, occasion. Uh, I thanks to all, everybody, and thanks to all. Uh,